Welcome to Johnny Likes, where I talk about movies that I like. And since it's Friday the 13th, I feel kind of obligated to talk about a Jason movie. Today, Johnny Likes, Friday the 13th, Part 2. Part 2 starts out with a recap of the ending of Part 1, through the eyes of Alice, the final girl from the first part. It starts off in a dream sequence in Alice's apartment, and ends up with her getting an ice pick through the temple by some mysterious killer. Now that that loose end is tied up and we're all caught up on the last film's events, we get to meet our new camp counselors. They are, of course, at Camp Crystal Lake, and it's now been five years since the events in the first film, and they're attempting to get the camp up and running for some kids to have fun. They get one night of peace and frivolity, and once the sun goes down the second night, they start to get picked off one by one by a mystery killer. Spoilers, it's Jason! I like this film for what it was. Everything that worked from the first film is back. The signature ch 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 sound. The Henry Manfredini score. The hot and horny young counselors. The location, the blood and guts, and the mystery killer. It's an 80s slasher film and it has all the trappings of the genre, for better or worse, depending on if you like that sort of thing. And I do. This film is probably best remembered as the first one to feature Jason as the killer. But in this he's not wearing a boiler suit, he doesn't have a hockey mask. Instead he's kind of looks like a farmer and he's got a pillowcase with like... He's got a sack over his head and one eye hole cut out. And instead of a machete, he seems to favor a pitchfork. The non-horror heads out there might be surprised to find out that that's originally what he looked like. So, the more you know. I always remember these movies as having more nudity than they actually do. This one had lots of suggestive but non-explicit shots of girls getting changed and in and out of showers, into the lake, that sort of thing. But overall, it was fairly mild on the nudity and sex side of things. Except for the one character, Terry. It seems like she wasn't allowed to wear a full shirt or a bra at any point in the movie. And there was a shot in the beginning with some glorious short shorts that went on for way longer than seemed appropriate. And it made me smile. For what was being featured and for the... And just for how long they held the shot. She's also out looking for her lost dog at night and decides to go skinny dipping. Is it logical? No. Did I care? Not especially. This film had perhaps the best cast of characters of the entire series. Not only did I not hate any of them, I actually liked them. Mark, the guy in the chair, and Vicky? The girl who has a crush on him. I thought they were kind of sweet. Although I will say I uh, started to question Vicky's judgment when she couldn't find Mark and decided to look upstairs. Mark, where are you? That was pretty funny. The lead counselor, Paul, and his assistant slash girlfriend, Ginny, also had some pretty good chemistry. All in all, a good cast. The deaths and gore in this one took a step down from the first one, though, which was unfortunate. Tom Savini did the effects on the first film, and his efforts are sorely missed here. The makeup was okay for the death scenes, but there wasn't too much creativity in them. I did like the look of disfigured Jason, I thought they did that pretty good, and the mother's severed head. So perfectly competent effects, just nothing special. This film had a strong finale, with Ginny running from Jason and stumbling into his hobo shack, complete with altar to mother's severed head with offerings surrounding it. Ginny does some quick thinking and decides to pretend to be Mrs. Voorhees and trick simple-minded Jason into letting her go. You've done your job well and mommy is pleased. That's a good boy. Come to mommy. Come on. I always thought that was quite a clever little bit, even if it didn't quite work out for her. So I'm gonna wrap up by talking about some of the dumb stuff that it's just best to ignore. First, Jason. So was he not drowned back in 58? If so, that would make him in his late 20s to early 30s for the events in part one, and at least in his early 30s, if not mid-30s, in this entry. 
But at the end of part one, when he pops out of the water, he looks to be about 14. So what's up with that? Messed up timeline. Second, why did Alice get spared at the end of the first movie by Jason? Especially when he goes and kills her at her apartment. Also, why would he bring his mother's severed head and put it in the fridge in her apartment? Was it to keep it fresh? Is her voice guiding him? Like, is she actually in his head and giving him advice? Because that would make sense, because he's a pretty dumb guy. I don't know how he found Alice, how he knew where she lived. But I guess he did. So the whole thing just doesn't stand up to very much scrutiny at all. But ultimately, I don't really care. I like this series. It's one of my favorite horror series, despite there not even being a really good movie in it. Which is kind of weird, because for all of the other big horror franchises, your Halloween, your Hellraiser, even Saw, there's at least one really good movie there. Whereas this series just doesn't have that. Nevertheless, this entry is on the stronger side, and I had fun, despite its shortcomings. And I'm going to give it a 3.5 out of 5. Those are my thoughts on part 2. You can leave yours in the comments. And I'll be back for part 3 the next time there's a Friday the 13th. In the meantime, you can like and subscribe, check out my other videos. Thanks for watching me talk about movies for a little bit, and you can tune in next time to see what else Johnny likes.